What we're building today across Verizon enables the digital promise of the future. Autonomous vehicles, abundance of screens, adaptive environments, immersive environments, augmented reality, blurring the lines between the physical and digital with innovators and developers everywhere and broadband connectivity anywhere. Changing the way we live and work for 8 billion hyper-connected people. 1 trillion connected things. Generating and consuming gigabytes of data with the ability to quantify everything. Becoming intelligent predictive and adaptive all powered by gigabit speeds deep fiber 5g mobility and seamless secure connectivity Hey, so good morning, Las Vegas. It's great to be with you today. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Hall, as Ken mentioned. I manage our global IoT platform at Verizon. I'm based out of uh, Basking Ridge, so made the journey out here. 100-degree uh, weather, wow. You don't realize how hot it is until you get out here, right? So today, I really want to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the trends that we're seeing in IoT, but take a look at some of the things that have happened in mobility. Uh, we'll also look at some connectivity, what we're doing in that space, and how our ecosystem of partners that are in this room, how we can work together to really bring IoT to the forefront. So as many of us have lived through it, we're going from smartphones to smart everything, right? We're at that turning point where many of us have seen the forecast, right, of 50 billion connected devices by the end of 2020. And how we get there is really up to the, the smart people uh, in this room to be able to get us there. But what I want to do is take a minute and step back for a second and just look back historically on where we've been. It took us about 10 years for all of us to adapt to the internet. And it's probably safe to say that there's not anybody that's not connected to the internet or using some type of internet connection in their everyday lives. It took us only five years to adapt to the smartphone. If I do a show of hands, how many of you have a smartphone? Awesome, all of you are raising your hand. When we think about smartphones, how many of you then have a smart TV? I have several now. How about one more question? How many of you have a smart shoe or a smart sneaker? A few of you, right? I bet you if I stand up here next year, the majority of us will raise our hand. Uh, as many of us know, uh, as IoT comes into our everyday lives, it'll further explode this evolution. Um, we're starting to see that where a normal shoe, right, can turn into a smart shoe to provide that important biometric feedback that you can provide to your doctor. Uh, as Jennifer just pointed out, that data becomes critical and how we get to that data is really uh, the next economic revolution. Technology is changing our lives. And for me personally, it's definitely changing my family. Uh, my mother-in-law is in an assisted living and I watched her go from withdrawn and isolated to alive and with us by giving her an Amazon Alexa. She was able to connect to news, weather, audible books, uh, and music all through using the, the, uh, the technology that we have today. And more and more of us are starting to see that as those physical and digital worlds start to connect through IoT. 
But as marketers and leaders in this business, it's always a good idea to look at some past trends. So let's just take a minute and uh, look at mobility. The expectations for mobility and the need for us to be constantly connected is changing the paradigm and disrupting the market in many ways. Uh, many of you uh, probably use the Starbucks app or the Dunkin' Donuts app to pre-order your coffee. Why? We hate to wait in line. We don't want to wait for our double mochaccino latte, right? How many of you summoned a, a driver to, to get to the hotel today via Uber, Lyft, or some other, right? Many of us. My husband took his first Uber uh, on vacation with us. Uh, via my sons, right? Um, my niece found her soon-to-be fiance via a dating app by swiping uh, left and right if she liked him or not. All right, many of us are seeing that. And it was perfectly normal for her to explain how she did it. Uh, the millennials are really changing uh, how we do business. How many of us are using Spotify or Pandora to curate our own radio stations? Uh, are you binge watching? What are you binge watching, right? Many of us are watching more and more TV today because we can do it on our own terms. So what's changing about that? We want what we want when we want it. I, W, W, I, W, 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 I, right? I want what I want when I want it. And the, the need for that constant connectivity is what's driving that. Many of us know we still need to communicate. That has not changed, but how and what we communicate is changing. And what is going to bridge the gap between that digital and physical worlds is IoT, the Internet of Things. Being able to have that connectivity um, and in really adapt that into our everyday lives as mobility has will be one of the big drivers. When we think about mobility and all of the things, let's just take one more example. Uh, many of you may have played or know somebody that played Pokemon Go, right? 97 million pounds were lost via Pokemon Go in the first four months. The government spent billions of dollars trying to teach us about eating right and moderated, uh, monosaturated fats and good healthy fats, right? They changed all the nutritional labels. They banned soda in school, all those good things. They could not, uh, they could not meet that same goal as Pokemon Go. That gamification, that ability to interact with each other is one of the key things. And so that will continue to evolve in the mobility space as we, as we want more and more connectivity. But IoT will also drive that. And what do we need to do to build a strategic strategy? We're seeing that familiar and similar trend there. So think about... Um, many of you are involved in one or all of these uh, parts of an IoT strategy, but it starts with three different areas. The first is connectivity. And when you think about the economic re uh, revolution of IoT and where we can make the money, we only see about 5% of the revenue coming in connectivity. In the platform space, probably about, it's 18, to, we'll say we'll roughly round it up to about 20%. And then in the applications is where the money is. 80% of it is at that application level. But how we get there. So I'm going to talk a little bit co about connectivity and some of the things that, that are changing there. But in the platform space, we need to continue to keep it open source as we're evolving these standards. Um, I am a Chamberlain user of the garage door opener. I, I love that application. Uh, the other day I was at uh, ShopRite, that's a local grocery store on the East Coast, and my aunt was at the house. I, she goes, I'm at your house, I want to drop off a couple of things uh, for you guys. I said, okay, no problem, I'll open up the garage. 
So from ShopRite, I opened up the garage for her, and she was able to, to walk in. She's like, how'd you do that? I said, I have an app. <laughs> um, this app can do all that, so you can remotely manage your, your home. But what the key thing was in the platform was, I can integrate my Nest smart thermostat in my Chamberlain app. What's going on behind the scenes, right? Open APIs are shared on the platform level for, for me to be able to do that. Me, as a consumer, I don't need to know that. We need to continue to evolve and work together to make sure that we keep that open source and continue to share APIs across the business. In the application space, the same holds true. As we were just learning about the importance of data and being able to monetize and curate that data to make it meaningful, that is the crux of IoT, right? But how we share that data uh, and conform to, of course, all the privacy and security standards that we need. We need to continue to evolve and be diligent about going after that. Some of the other strategic pillars that you have as you're building an IoT strategy are, first, of course, you need to enable it, right? So whether that's uh, hardware, uh, connectivity, managed services, whatever you need to be able to do there. And then you need to create those strategic partnerships. IoT has taught us that nobody can do it alone. We, we all need to partner together, and you need to create uh, domain expertise uh, and go after those partners where you can really grow the revenue or grow some of your business goals for, you, for your customers. The other one is investing. So whether that's product capital that you need to invest in, it could be acquisitions, it could be fundings, uh, whatever you need to be able to invest, uh, could be resources, and then innovate. We all know that the next technology is right on our heels. We're starting to, to see that already with uh, drones in the unmanned aerospace area. Autonomous vehicles are being tested. Uh, we know they're coming. So how are we getting ready for that? I will talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing at uh, Verizon through some of the strategic partners uh, with many of your organizations that are with us today. So first, let's talk about connectivity and what we're seeing in this space. So as you think about connectivity, it's no longer one size fits all. We're customizing the connectivity to be able to meet the IoT solution. Originally, when IoT first came on the board, right, it was telemetry, it was M to M. I'm probably dating myself, right? But we conform to mobility, right? We conform to the smartphone standards. And it's no longer that way. We're starting to see a shift where IoT is driving our investments in the network and connectivity. And why is that? As more and more of us want to get into that business, we need to drive down the cost and so that we can increase the amount of devices and scale. So how do we do that? We offer a variety of, of chipsets from our various partners. We've got some awesome strategic partners. Uh, some of them I'll mention here, uh, Sequans, Ublox, Qualcomm, Altair, um, Jamalto, Sierra. I'm probably missing a few. I apologize. Uh, but we need those strategic partnerships. And we all need to come to the table to bring, to bring these solutions to our customers. You've got CAT3, which is your high end, your luxury tracking type devices. Um, and you can see at the top bar there the amount of addressable market. There are 22 million in those luxury type products. CAT1, as we started to look at the standards, the 3G PP standards is what we're following. They came out in 2015. We were one of the first to come out with CAT1 at the end of 2016, really driving down the, the low data throughputs and providing a value add at a lower cost. M more for that medical and bio and the electronics and some of the food safety type devices. And then we went to CAT M1, and this year we launched in uh, March of 2017, and then in May we added the Volti. So for commercial trailers, recreational, water, meter, water meters, municipal assets, driving down 
the data throughputs so that we can increase the battery life and the power saving modes for those types of objects that need that. And you can see the demand of the devices goes up, it, it triples, 240 million devices uh, in that space. As we move even forward to MBIOT, we'll drop the cost even further and then get up to the, to the millions. But what we're seeing here and what's important is there's not one size fits all anymore. We don't need to conform to the mobility. We're actually seeing IoT connectivity options for us, and it's BYOC. Bring your own connectivity, Mr. Customer, and we'll help you create the platform and the application that you need. So whether that's Bluetooth, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, whatever you need to be able to provide that. I'm gonna talk about two other areas of connectivity, and that's global and uh, 5G. So the first is global. Many of you may have recall at Verizon, we had a strategic partnership with Vodafone, and three years ago, we decided that we were gonna buy them out. And we bought out that uh, partnership, and it changed the way we did business. And why is that? One of the big drivers for us not only was our retail uh, devices, but it was IoT. We have many multinational customers that need global IoT. And so as carriers in the business, we needed to get together. And we created strategic partnerships with MNOs across the board, um, as well as uh, the cloud sim technology that we use uh, with a company called uh, Globe Touch, uh, and my friend is here today uh, with us. And we cover now 197 countries across the, across the board for connectivity. We've got over 400 global capable devices. Uh, so it's an amazing to see that, and it's really driven on our customers. Our customers are asking for this, uh, and many of it has to do with IoT. The GSMA is working through some of the standards that we need to be able to comply to the regulatory standards in each of these countries, but we need to continue to, to fuel the GSMA to be able to create those standards so that we can continue to scale. Um, IoT knows no, knows no limits, right? And they're really uh, challenging us to make sure that we can create these complicated solutions, not only domestically, but around the world. The other big thing that's happening in connectivity is 5G. And for Verizon, we've been at 4G for the last five years. And every day, we are pushing the envelope when it comes to this technology. Tremendous amount of data throughput. And so we are primed to really go after the 5G market. 5G will be about speed, it'll be about low latency, and it'll be about scale. In order, us, in order for us to get to that 50 billion devices for M to M, we will need to scale. 5G will help us get there. What's important to remember when it comes to 5G is there are benefits to fiber. We are making over a $9 billion investment in the infrastructure for 5G. We are at the, uh, we are committed to being the first in the market uh, with 5G. We're driving some of the standards when it comes to doing this. Um, originally, the plan was to do this by 2020, but one of the key driving factors to get this in now is IoT. We need that bridge between the digital and physical worlds, and IoT will be that bridge. Think about mission critical devices and low latency on medical devices, robotics, autonomous vehicles. In order to get there, we're going to need the fiber that we're going to get from 5G. And of course, the standards have not caught up to the need yet. So we need to continue to drive the standards to be able to, to adopt that for our customers. The other thing that I want to leave you with, with 5G, it's more about an evolution. 
it's not a replacement of 4G LTE and 4G Advanced. Those networks will continue. We will continue to invest in them, and we will continue to evolve them. 5G will, will be uh, an additional element to our feature set and our wireless connectivity. So where are we? Right now, we've, we are testing in 11 cities around the world. Every day, we're adopting new customers to be able to kick the tires and trial it. We really want this technology to start to come out and meet the needs of our customers, whether it's replacing wireless broadband in the home or connecting an autonomous vehicle at the edge. We want to be able to provide that, so we're making that strategic investment. And when I talk a little bit about our smart cities, you'll start to see that total picture and why it's critical uh, for us to be able to, to get to, to 5G. So before I talk about uh, smart communities and what we're doing as far as the application, I want to take a minute and look at this digital ecosystem and where we see that coming together. And, and for Verizon, we can start at the edges, right? Those are the applications. Where we made our, our bets was some of the key areas uh, for our customers. One of them was a product called Gridwide. In util utilities, demand response, water monitoring uh, was critical for our customers. Uh, millions of meters out there today, and all of us need to be able to have uh, smart utilities, if you will. Track and trace, many of us know, asset tracking is critical. Knowing where things are and how we can adopt those products uh, for our customers is critical. The analytics, of course, is critical. What we get out of the network uh, and uh, the ability to, to get that data and make it meaningful, as we heard earlier, that is a key element. Um, I will further that and say that our customers are saying, we need more data. I need more things to be able to create my application. They're asking for a data lake, if you will, so that they can take data from various pools and be able to create a meaningful revenue source for them. The other one is drones. You may have seen the news that we bought a company called Skyward uh, in the fourth quarter of last year for drone management. We see that as the next frontier. And then our millennials, right? They're really changing the paradigm for us in many ways, not only in mobility, but in uh, sharing options. Going from ownership to usership, really, where city bikes, uh, recreational vehicles, um, zip car, right, are all changing uh, what we do. I also just saw in Brooklyn, they're actually doing, uh, you can rent uh, pet carriers. Uh, and they will air conditioning your pet carrier. They'll make sure that you know where it is and you get a mobile app so that you know and you can see your pet in the, the carrier. So that, that was pretty cool. Uh, consumer and connected home. I gave you a few examples of how uh, the whole house is, is connected, but many of you probably have a lot of connected solutions. Uh, at Verizon, we've got our, our Fios business, and so we're connecting that business with a smart hub uh, and doing some over the top. We've also got our acquisition with uh, AOL and Yahoo in our, our oath, uh, which we're curating that data to be able to provide advertising as well. I'm going to uh, hold off on smart communities, and I'll tell you a little bit about that vision in the next few, few slides. But for us, not only is it key with the network, it also has that enablement of our platform, which is called ThingSpace, that user enablement platform where we can provide that ability for a developer or a customer to be able to quickly prototype. So one of the things that we've changed uh, at Verizon was we opened up the APIs. We didn't want to make it so complex for a customer to be able to do rapid prototyping. 
So we have open APIs on the site. You can come in and use, um, whether it's our MapQuest APIs through the acquisition of AOL. You can get SMS APIs all on the site. We've got dev kits where you can spin it up very quickly. Uh, there's a forum support, so two-way support. Uh, I invite you to, to register on verizon.thinkspace.com and come and kick the tires and see uh, what it's all about. Many of our customers, uh, we've got over 30 million uh, connections uh, using our ThingSpace Manage portal to be able to manage the life cycle of their device from uh, throughout the supply chain. So from activation and testing all the way through, through the life cycle management of their device, running reports, getting data analytics from those devices, whether it's uh, US or globally, they can get it all through one portal. Um, we also will be uh, coming out in a, in a quickly in a future release of a robust market. Today we've got uh, some of our basic solutions that are there uh, in the store. Our aspiration is to provide publishing capabilities for a developer to quickly publish uh, applications there as well as provide additional tool sets and data elements for, for customers to, to rapidly prototype and create. Uh, new monetization model, model. So smart communities. Some of the big bets, and let me just back up a second at, at Verizon. I was telling uh, Carl in the back. At, at Verizon, we just, uh, many of you may work for a large organization and uh, constant org changes, right? But they really tell us where the business is going. Uh, we recently just did uh, an organizational change and we created some strategic business units because we see the, the shift to this digital world and really moving away from a traditional telecom to a more uh, technology-based organization. So, so what did we do? We still have Marnie Walden. She is heading up our media business now. So she's got our new acquisition of, a, of Yahoo, which just closed in June, and synergizing that with AOL and creating, we created a company called Oath. Um, but you think about advertising and the media, and I'll show you where we're, we're playing there in a minute. And then she also manages our telematics business. Uh, one of the key tenants for us is telematics and transportation. We did some recent acquisitions with uh, Fleetmatics, Telogis. Uh, the, the earlier one was Hughes Telematics with Network Fleet. Uh, we see transportation and telematics as a key tenant uh, and a key driver for us as we, as we look to create us seamlessly throughout our, our lives, if you will. And then on the other side, uh, John Stratton is managing our IoT business, so the ThingSpace platform as well as our smart communities. And why did we do that? So it all drives to the smart community vision. So I'm going to start from the street layer or that, that lower level. As we think about the fiber of one fiber being created, connecting that via a small cell or the wireless technology, we know we need to connect those worlds. Uh, and what's ironic, as more and more of us are going wireless, the only way you can get fully wireless is from a wireline of fiber, autonomous vehicles. So as we won the city of Boston and we're making a millions and billion dollar investment in that city um, in, in re doing all of their fiber and infrastructure, we're adding the wireless elements for autonomous vehicles, for smart pipe parking, for smart traffic, for intelligent video, so that we can change what we're doing there. It all happens at the city control level through the nodes and the network, so that customers at that middle level can really, uh, we've got developers that can innovate, because as we're seeing in IoT, there's no stopping the imagination when it comes to creating new solutions. Our job is just to provide the tools to be able to do that. Uh, with the acquisition of uh, liquid Wi-Fi in the fourth quarter of last year, we can provide digital signage. So think about uh, free Wi-Fi in the cities. Um, one of the things that we are seeing in some of the wins that we have the, the killer application in a city is Wi-Fi. 
the killer application in a city is Wi-Fi. Why? Because the cities can provide the citizens in that city free emergency. We can provide internet access to those that may not be able to afford it, education. Uh, so think about the city and what they're looking at. Uh, the other ones that we'll have that you may know already, lighting, uh, smart lighting, smart parking, video surveillance, and then of course the venues, things like uh, Caesar's Palace here and being able to manage all that. All comes to the top. For us uh, folks living in these towns, the citizens that live there, as well as um, being customers, we really want to provide a holistic experience for them. So the other thing that's important to keep in mind is when it comes to smart communities, there's different ways and lenses to look at it. Um, as many of you may work with municipalities and government entities, they're driven a little differently, right? They're voted into office, and so the P&L is always challenging to find money, but they want to be able to innovate and provide their citizens with um, things like free internet. And they want to be able to really manage the city in a meaningful way. The water department needs the information so they can change what's going on at the traffic level. So they're looking for one platform. Instead of going from a multi-cloud environment, they want a single cloud environment. Um, they want to be able to, like the city of Chicago, many of you have heard the city of Chicago selected Azure as their platform. But then how can they work with Amazon or Verizon to be able to curate that data? Cities don't want to manage the complicated uh, environment of having a, many, many different partners. They want to have one partner to be able to do all that. So we're doing some of that for them by handling some of the complexity behind the scenes for the cities. And what we've done here, in, <clears throat> you may have saw the press release in uh, June of this year, just last month, we did the first public private partnership with the city of Sacramento. Uh, we're going to invest more than $100 million in the city, giving them the resources so that they can reduce some of the barriers that the citizens have, have had. Uh, we're putting in 15 of the kiosks, uh, which will enable free Wi-Fi for the students in uh, middle school, high school, elementary school. We're also fueling them with our um, STEM programs so that we can help the students um, continue to evolve. And how did we do that? One of the things that we at Verizon and many of you uh, may work for a large organization in the city space, uh, Verizon had probably 20 to 30 folks working on the city, all working in silos. Uh, our wireline team didn't talk to the wireless team, didn't talk to the network team, which was investing in uh, you know, the, the, um, things like the network uh, for the Super Bowl or things like the network with small, small cells. So what we did is we pulled all that together. And when I say One Verizon, that's what I mean. We really want to show the city that we can create a holistic approach for them but more about sitting down with the mayor like we did with uh, Mayor Steinberg. And we said, how can we help you? What are some of the key things that you're looking at? And one of the ones was being able to provide the citizens with better education, uh, free Wi-Fi, uh, better, better traffic. Uh, those were some of the things that were keeping him up at night. And so that's the way we're changing the paradigm to really go after it and say, how can we help the citizens uh, and help the city uh, get to reach their goals? Uh, smart cities is very, very complicated, um, but more and more of us are starting to see that we can adopt that and then create other things. So Verizon, we're making that strategic bet to do that with one fiber as well as uh, some of the acquisitions that I just mentioned. The other one is the city of Boston. You may have he heard of Vision Zero. Uh, I, uh, I live very close to Manhattan, uh, and many of you may have seen this in other cities, but the majority of people are walking around Manhattan like this, all walking through, and what's happening is 
Uh, they're going through red, they're going across streets when they're not supposed to walk, and they're getting hit. So Vision Zero is about no accidents, being able to use technology to detect people in intersections so that we can change that paradigm. We do not want to have any accidents when we can prevent it. The other thing that we did, which is, is pretty unique as far as the data goes, so we put some nodes in in the center of, of Boston, right on Massachusetts Avenue, if you're familiar with the city of Boston. And during the Super Bowl, uh, a giant fan here, but uh, so we, won't, we don't talk about the, the outcome, but uh, in the third quarter, what we were seeing in this mass uh, intersection was a spike in the traffic. And we were able to show the city this data, and they were able to reroute the traffic to make it safer for the people walking in that area. It was a high uh, pedestrian walk area, and they were having a lot of accidents. And so we were able to change that for them, and they had no accidents during that time. It's fantastic. And, and some of these um, things happen because of some accidents that happened prior to that, and which was the case in this one. But we were able to help the city of Boston make those changes. Um, during the Super Bowl in Houston, uh, with the uh, amount of things that are going on in the world with terrorism attacks, we added additional security, and we added the, the, um, the nodes, the sensor nodes, the lighting sensor nodes, so that we can detect anomalies uh, for, the, for Houston, and they had no accidents. So I'm going to show you a video clip which, which talks a little bit about what we, what we did there. But more and more of our customers, not only in cities, but large venues, are looking to do that. So as, as we close out here, we think about uh, enabling IoT solutions and developing that IoT strategy. So uh, we think about enabling, investing, partnering, and innovating. And IoT, if you can imagine it, we can do it. Technology is not holding us back anymore. So as we wrap up here, IoT is definitely driving the next economic revolution. As leaders in this industry, I ask that you leave here today and think about partnerships, think about strategic things that you need to do for your business to be able to evolve that so that we can move the needle uh, and we can do it together. Uh, one of the key things that we need to remember is no one can do it alone. Uh, we all need to band together to make sure that we can drive the standards and, and move the needle. Before I take questions, I want to end uh, with a quick uh, video. So if you can roll the tape. Infrastructure aging, traffic congestion, public safety, energy use, unequal access to technology. Every municipality wants to improve the lives of their citizens, but challenges like these often stand in the way of a happier, safer, more engaged community. We're proud of the fact that we're the capital city and the center of public service, but we need to be so much more. We need to build a high-wage, modern economy. Tech is at the center of that. We sort of set out our objectives, not only to build infrastructure, to connect our communities, but to deliver smart city solutions that could solve some of our most pressing challenges. This is where Verizon comes in with our smart community solutions. For us, it's about using our assets to help people, from fiber network to advanced wireless, to telematics, to the cloud, to data analytics and algorithms. What we're showing here in Palo Alto is some of our smart lighting technology. We put a number of sensors, including motion sensors and a video sensor that is detecting activity here on the street. It's not just about the raw video, but rather running analytics to detect a vehicle or pedestrians as they come through that intersection. Here in Boston, we're running one fiber. As our customers grow, 5G and all the other wireless services will be able to build off the backbone we're doing now. What we're building here is something that's going to be extremely important, not just for tomorrow, but for the next generation of young people in our city. This truly is game changing for us in the city of Boston. We have this powerful kiosk that allows for two-way communication between citizens and their local community and the city. It really brings together the best of Verizon all in a single solution. We live in a more and more connected society, and the more that the citizens can actually engage with policymakers, whether it be with tech companies, whether it be with job creation, this kind of partnership allows those opportunities to flourish. That's why integral 
public-private partnerships like the one we are announcing with Verizon today will help bring technology and bring people together to enable the kind of growth that makes for a better community.